So one of the most amazing stories out of the Honshu tsunami is a story of a classroom of actually an entire school, a middle school. Um, I'm not sure if uh, one of the things I've done for the last several years along with Bill Knight is I issue the tsunami warnings from the warning center. So we get a lot of neat stories, sad stories too. But one of the stories that is really mind-blowing to me was a story of a school when Japan issued their first warning, they have different levels of evacuation. So they thought the earthquake was a 7.9. So they issued a warning level, an evacuation level to the 7.9. Well, then the magnitude 9 actually happened within minutes of the 7.9, and then there was a second 9. So it was actually three earthquakes at once. Insane. So they couldn't tell the folks that had evacuated to the 7.9 level that it was actually a 9. So we had people that were safely evacuated that got inundated. It's horrible. Um, so anyway, the, the, these two schools, uh, it was a high school, middle school combined, and then an elementary school. These two schools were in, at that 7-9 level, and they were all up on the top floor and the roof, and they were all ready. And for some reason, the kids weren't okay with that. The kids in the elementary school weren't okay with that. And they just, they just, they took off and they went up the hill and the teachers went right with them. And what was, what's so beautiful about this story is the trust between the students and the teachers. Amazing. So anyway, all these kids go taken off up the hill. The teachers go right with them. The other school's watching and goes, you know, we're going with them. So then all three schools are marching up the hill and on their way up the hill, they probably gathered up another couple thousand just residents that said, okay, they're going, we're going with them, and all those lives were saved. So that's, to me, that's just, gives me goosebumps, even as we speak. So that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Kids that know what to do can absolutely save lives, and I'm hoping to inspire you guys to inspire the kids, okay? We've got lots of tools, I don't have much time. The question is, will it happen here? Yes or no, hands up, yell at me, dance. Yes, yes, we are unanimous. We're unanimous on this, thank goodness. So I don't know if you can see all those little blue squares on there, but those are all the tsunamis that we have uh, recorded with good verification throughout history that originated here, not that hit here. Okay. So, of course, um, <clears throat> this is the modeled wave from the potential magnitude 9 off of Cascadia. And the rupture zone extends from Vancouver Island all the way down to the Mendocino Ridge. Now, we don't know if it'll be one giant earthquake that size, but magnitude nines consistently in Sumatra in uh, 1964 in Alaska, 1960 in Chile, they are all about this size, which is about 1,000 kilometers. So it's locked. The reoccurrence intervals every 400 years. The last time you guys had this was in 1700. So yeah, we're, we're due. So just be vigilant, please. Even though you're south of there, it would still be very bad here. All right, so what we need to think about are the warning signs. So what will you feel? A nature's warning sign, any ideas? Earthquake, shaking, okay, let's keep going. What will you see? Maybe the water going out. Now, this is where I want you guys to be taking notes on your warning signs. Whoever has the longest list gets an extra prize from me on warning signs, okay? Okay, how about what will you hear? Loud roar is a good one. Okay, how about smell? Any thoughts on that? Dead fish, possibly if they're dead yet. You know, when, it, when the tsunami withdraws, and we're talking about right at the time when it's happening, nature's warning signs, the fish are still flopping usually. But one thing, I don't know if anybody caught the news the other day about the toads. There's this uh, correlation of toads, and so far it's been Italy and China and Southern California, just down on the uh, San Andreas, and I'm thinking Greece, where the toads actually evacuate days before an earthquake. 
and then they actually return after the earthquake. And so this might be the first real science we have with animals in correlation with earthquakes. And I, what the guess is is that they're smelling methane that's being squeezed in the soil. Now, you need to have methane in the soil for them to smell it, so I don't know if we can use toads consistently. And the ones in California actually evacuated three days ahead of time. That's a slow evacuation. They had to take their time. All right. So how do we learn these things? How do we learn what the warning signs are? Observation, absolutely. And we learn them from people who have survived them. And the best teachers are the kids. Okay. Nature's warning signs are the local tsunami. And I cannot warn you about a local tsunami. There is no way. And even though at the warning center I have to get a warning out in five minutes, I still won't be able to warn you for a local tsunami. So knowing the warning signs and teaching those warning signs and practicing is really critical. All right, this is what it might look like. One of the things I have to do, we all have to do, is unteach some bad science that's gotten out there. This is what we call an advisory level tsunami. And when the warning center issues an advisory, it means clear the beach. It's a call to action. It means clear the harbor. Because this thing's pretty dangerous. It doesn't mean evacuate the town. It means clear the beach. Tsunamis go about 35 miles an hour. And in Alaska, I can say that's about as fast as a bear. What do you guys have that's equivalent to that? Cougar, maybe? I don't know how fast they are. Anyway, it's faster than I can run. Okay. Somebody said the water will go out. Everybody's got that on their list, I hope. This is Valdez. Everybody pick a top of a building that you would stand on. Hurry, pick it quick. Pick one. How'd you do? Who survived? Right on. Awesome. You can't count on the water going out. That's if the trough arrives first. Remember, a tsunami's period is, could be 100 miles apart. So if the tsunami's trough arrives first, that's when the water will recede first. You can't count on that warning sign. Okay. It might come in like a fast flood, like the first video, or it might recede, or it might not do either. In Crescent City in 2006, it just super filled the harbor. There was no current, there was no wave, there was no recession, and all of a sudden the docks are buckling. You can't trust this thing, okay? Crazy currents, though, you can trust that. All right, I need to click along because I'll just keep cruising. What causes your local tsunamis usually is a landslide that can be above or below water. If you guys have fun with bathymetry, especially in Google Ocean, you can see a bunch of old landslide scarps. Okay, official warning signs. What does an official warning sign feel like? A little stressful, a little tension. Other than that, it doesn't really feel like much unless you're right there. How about what does it look like? Be writing these down. I want a big long list, you guys. Might see something on television. Maybe? You, you see warnings on the... Really? Okay, that's neat. Right, of course. Mm-hmm. That was the precursor. You betcha. I was on the phone with your emergency managers. Hey, next time, take a video for me. Awesome. My new best friend. Okay, what does it sound like? Sirens, if you can hear them. It really depends on the community. Now, the state of California has been really, really great about outfitting the coast. But when a, when a coastal town needs sirens, they do that through their state. But the sirens actually belong to those cities. They don't belong to the state, and they don't belong to NOAA. So it's up to the cities to, to be on top of that. So if you guys want more sirens, you need to talk to those city managers, OK? All right, what does an official warning smell like? Depends on how you, the guy sitting next to you reacts to it, probably. Okay. How do you learn about these? 
experience and also it's up to me and Cindy and Bill and our friends Jim Goltz and John Schelling and Althea and Irv, all of our state people, all of our firemen, it's up to all of us to teach you and to practice, right? And it's up to you guys to practice even if we don't remind you to. So how about that for passing the buck? All right, these are really great for the distant warning. On Honshu, we had over 10 hours. For an event off of Alaska, you might have five. For Cascadia, I'm thinking, what do you think, Bill? 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Okay, so Cascadia is a local warning. By the way, in Honshu, it really was less than a minute because the island subsided, it sunk. Okay, off we go. This is what the official warning place looks like where Bill and I spent way many nights and days and who knows what, right? Kind of looks like the Millennium Falcon. And that is our gnarly crew, that's it. Isn't that fun? We've got seismologists, oceanographers, we even have a guy that's into astrophysics, mathematicians, physicists, geophysics. What am I missing? IT, ET. So we are totally, multily uh, trained and it takes about five years to really be able to do this well. It's pretty intense. That's what that warning center, itty bitty little building in Palmer, Alaska is responsible for the entire continent. Who knew that in here? Awesome, so that's one thing you got. We got the whole continent. And it's Bill's fault we have the East Coast, by the way. Okay, this is how the official warning gets out. You can get a text on your cell phone, you can get it on a pager, you can get it tattooed on your kid's head, we can do it. All right. I want to keep going because I want to talk about kids. Hey, so what's your favorite thing? Everybody shout it out. Mine's chocolate. Louder. Beer. Awesome. Wine, cheese. Kitties. I get that answer a lot. Okay, I want everybody to get up. Just get up. I mean, you know, you got to do this in your classroom. And I tell you what, it's really hard with high school kids. They just, are, just don't want to do this. The little kids are great, but high school kids don't. So what I do with high school kids is I make them just stand on one leg, but I don't tell them the way to do it is to bend the other knee, right? But I figure, you know, hopefully they don't need practice for, you know, potential law situations, but they can practice. All right, so we're gonna do this together. You ready? We're gonna count. So, there we go. Everybody up on a leg. One chocolate, two chocolate, three chocolate. You should be counting. Four chocolate, five chocolate, Wait a minute, there's five. Okay, <laughs> six chocolate, seven chocolate, come on louder, eight chocolate, nine chocolate, 10 chocolate, 11 chocolate, 12 chocolate, 13 chocolate, 14 chocolate, 15 chocolate, 16 chocolate, 17 chocolate, 18 chocolate, 19 chocolate, 20, awesome. Thank you for getting up, waking up, it's great. You know, the thing is, is it's really, really important that the teachers do this with the kids, right? You gotta do it with the kids so they know you're into it. 20 seconds is a magnitude seven. It's really easy. That's an incredibly easy thing to do. You can all sit down now, thanks. Um, I wonder, maybe I'll sit down with you. No, so um, anyway. A magnitude 7 is enough to generate a local landslide tsunami. That might be the most important thing I can teach, you guys can teach. Isn't that amazing? All this education is distilled to 20 seconds. But make them count slowly, because who has not been in an earthquake? Really? In California? No kidding. Well, even Arizona and New Jersey, I tell you. Wow, okay, who has been? All right, so there's a bunch of us. Time's weird, isn't it? In a, in a decent-sized earthquake, time is weird. And the other thing we use a favorite thing for and something that we don't spend a lot of time on but we should spend more on is mental health and disasters, PTSD, shock, just how to prepare for that, how to stay calm for that. So that's why we think of a favorite thing. So when they need that skill, they're actually thinking of something they love. You know, so it might be their teddy bear, it might be chocolate. For me, chocolate's good. Okay. If you go to 30 seconds, it's a magnitude eight. Pretty easy, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. 
All right? Everybody good on that? Okay, what about a nine? How long does a nine go for? Hmm. Let's look at some of the energy that we're talking about. Can you guys read this okay? So we've got that 5-8 in Virginia just a little while ago, all the way up to the 7 in Haiti. So this is comparing the energy from each of these earthquakes and their magnitudes. This is a movie that my colleague um, at the Hawaiian Warning Center has put together. So just keep watching. So we're going to compare. This thing's great for scale. Great for thinking about energy. So what's bigger than a 7? And look at Northbridge. Anybody here live through Northbridge? Yeah, that was, that was a rocker, right? Okay, so. It's, it's something. It is. It is, and it's correlative to the amount of energy that's released. Now, that is completely dependent on what kind of rock it's in and how deep it is. But generally, for the more shallow ones that we can feel, 20, 20 seconds is a good rule of thumb. Okay, did you see that? There goes Sumatra, Samoa, dust is 778183. See how little Northbridge got? There's that 85 in Sumatra. All of these are tsunamogenic, every single one of them, including Haiti. We had a local tsunami from North Northbridge, by the way, just a little local guy. There's that 88 from Chile. And that would be last March. It's pretty big. And there's the Indian Ocean tsunami. And there's the Great Alaska Earthquake. And then there's the mother of them all, Chile. How's that work for you? Is that pretty effective? Okay, so y'all can send Nathan a note and tell him thanks, because he's keeping it up to date, which is really nice. All right. Has everybody been to the Warning Center's website? Has anybody been there? To, okay, the way you get there is tsunami.gov. And tsunami.gov is going to be our portal for everything officially tsunami. And I've got a, I've got a list of links that I will um, include that'll go on the web for this presentation. So that'll be there. And then if you click on the Alaska Warning Center, it's a funky URL, which is why I'm not spouting it at you. This is the best way to get there. Type toe at the end, toe. Tsunami Outreach and Education. That's my secret hold. The username is public. And the password is earthquake. And the reason it's passworded is because um, it's not all ready for sign language. A lot of it's projects and development. But tons of movies, tons of stories, tons and tons and tons of great resources. You can email me. I can help you get in. I can load stuff there for you. All right, magnitude 9, that's where we were. Here's another comparison of energy. I was trying to figure out. I was working with our seismologist, Dr. Huang, one of the best on the planet. People talk about bombs. Kids don't know bombs. They don't know nuclear bombs. They can't imagine that. That's our generation. So I was thinking, what, what can they relate to? And so we thought we'd look at maybe World Trade Center collapsing. So I don't know. That didn't seem to make it either. I don't know if they could really, really grasp seven, 748, 100,000. World Trade Center. So then we decided to do number of years of world energy. And this is everything. This is coal, this is hydro, this is oil, electric, all of it. Every kind of energy that our planet uses today, a magnitude 9.5 would power the planet for 500 years. I like that. I can work with that. 500 years, one earthquake. Too bad we can't harness that, huh? How long does a magnitude nine shake for? Well, if it knocks you down and you can't stand up, that's a nine. If you can't physically get up, if you're on the ground and you can't move, that's a magnitude nine. They shake for up to five minutes. 
and the ground ripples, sometimes up to three feet. The trees actually become ductile and touch the ground. These are trees that are solid, will bend and touch the ground. It's very serious. Five minutes. Okay, so think about it. If you're next to the ocean and I want you to evacuate in 20 seconds and you're in a building that's shaking for five minutes, you have to survive the earthquake if you're going to survive the tsunami. But if you're like the folks in Japan, you better get the heck out of there within 20 seconds, right? Really. So this is something that you guys need to look at your own personal classrooms and really work with your kids. It's got to be done individually. How are you going to get out if it's a nine? While the building's shaking and stuff is falling. Very creepy. So that's the kind of thing, that's the takeaway. I want you to know that we're very serious. That's, that's, that's the advice. But you, you have to survive that earthquake if you're going to survive the tsunami. So has everybody got the magnitude, what I'm talking about on that? Kind of tricky. OK. OK, so that's pretty much the basic rule of thumb for sure if you're right by the water. Now, of course, if you're not by the water and you're in a magnitude 9, just stay protected, you know, under your table or in the corner, wherever it is you're, you're getting safe with your kids. But if you're next to the water, even if it's a big lake in a big earthquake, they're very deep and they can absolutely have local landslides and have local tsunamis that way. This group, the uh, I, I, uh, INS or ISDR, they're out of Switzerland, and they're um, a UNICEF organization. They've got a bunch of really, really great media, but I will give that to you, too. So some of the things that are incredible about Tilly's story is uh, she has survivor guilt. That's really normal. Um, <clears throat> she had to leave her mother behind. And that's something to really address with kids, kind of do a powwow. What do you do if they won't go? You know, and so if you're going to practice th this kind of thinking, critical thinking, having a buddy system. So you know, if maybe you have that one boy or girl that's going to be the hero and go get grandma or go get baby brother, and really different family members or and that's our extended families as well need to who's already decide that in advance who's going to go get you know baby Joey or grandma so we don't have more people not going by the way we lost an entire bus full of seniors in the Chilean tsunami because they chose to evacuate by bus. And if they just would have hoofed it, they would have made it. So don't get in a car, just go. So these are kind of some of the insights. And uh, Tilly is, she, she won an award from Thailand as a heroine for saving so many lives. And it's good to know the word. And it's amazing because they don't have tsunamis in England. So, you know, Absolutely, there isn't anyone that doesn't need this knowledge, no matter what. Okay, so, um, which think about is how long the wavelength is on a tsunami is, you know, it can be 100 miles apart, peak to peak. So a wind wave, when it, when it breaks into its crest, it's when the bottom of that circle is touching bottom. Well, the bottom of the tsunami wave is actually into the mantle somewhere. Right, So when it stacks up and it's getting shallower, it ends up acting like a bore tide. It actually kind of turns back on itself. That's something Bill can show you with the wave tanks. So <clears throat> that's really, really common, that frothy bore tide, just like a wall of foam. And because uh, it's not cool for a lot of kids to be talking about the head of a beer, in the US, I use root beer float here. But you know, I, head of a beer is fine. So does that make sense? OK. Um, we should break up? Yep. OK. So we have, what, about 40? OK. So we were thinking four groups of 10. And um, we've segregated Bill because he's the only guy. <laughs> I'm kidding. He's got all the tanks over here. And the three of us are over there at those three tables. Plus, we've added a whole bunch of giveaways on this far table over here, videos and stuff that didn't get put in your goodie bags. So help yourselves. And then there's resources on the center table, but there are personal ones, so we don't have copies. But feel free to look at them. They're good ones, OK? Thank you so much for listening. Please get a hold of me if you have any questions, OK?
Anyway, um, anyway um, so I'll so read it to you. you and we've got thoughts right here. Believe it or not, it's your calendar. Even though it's a bubbling sound can signal that it's not a Yeah. This is a food coloring cap. String. I'm going to yank them to get the. By the way, during a real earthquake like in Cascadia, the actual eruption moves about two kilometers a second. So it takes minutes. Quickly, that it'll show you if you're in a ball rupture hazard.